Behind the capture of mob boss Whitey Bulger, he was on the run for 16 years and near the top of the FBI's most wanted list. And like Bonnie and Clyde, Bulger turned into a kind of folk anti-hero, inspiring Hollywood movies like The Departed. So how was he finally caught? Seth Doan begins our coverage. His name is James Bulger. They called him Whitey because he had blonde hair when he was a kid. He eventually grew up to become boss of the notorious Irish mob of South Boston. Whitey Bulger was behind a string of murders, and some of those were murders that he ordered. Some of those are murders that he participated in. CBS This Morning senior correspondent John Miller is a former assistant director of the FBI. Whitey Bulger basically recruited an FBI agent and basically said, I'll give you information. At some point, the music stopped. And Whitey Bulger knew a big indictment was coming down, and he decided to go on the run. In 1995, Bulger simply disappeared, living a life on the lam with his girlfriend, Catherine Grieg, always staying one step ahead of the law. I think if you look at the 10 most wanted list, um, Whitey Bulger probably fell right behind Osama bin Laden. This is an announcement by the FBI. In 2011, the FBI decided to put out a public service announcement. It worked. A woman in Iceland saw the PSA in a news report and recognized Bulger and Grieg as her former neighbors in Santa Monica, California. The FBI finally had their man. At 81 years old, he was grayer, slower, and more bald. But after 16 years as one of America's most wanted, the fascination with Whitey Bulger had only begun. For CBS This Morning Saturday, I'm Seth Doan. And joining us now is Dick Lair, a former reporter at the Boston Globe. His first book on Whitey Bulger, titled Black Mass, is being made into a movie starring Johnny Depp. And he has inside details about Bulger's capture in his new book, Whitey, The Life of America's Most Notorious Mob Boss. Good morning, Dick. Thanks for being here. Thank you. You talk in this about, about Whitey Bulger making one big mistake, ultimately, that led to his capture involving befriending a neighbor. What happened there exactly? Well, the, the neighbor was the Icelandic woman that you mentioned in your setup. Uh, she uh, befriended the, the couple, uh, Whitey, known as Charlie Gasco, and his wife, Carol Gasco. They shared an interest in cats, and, mm -hmm. and uh, they became acquaintances on the streets of Santa Monica uh, caring for a stray cat. But Whitey left an indelible impression on the woman from Iceland, the visitor, when she happened to express admiration for President Obama. And Whitey is, is some, he's a racist. He believes in, in separate and unequal. And he flipped out on her. Right. Uh, and so um, She he, never forgot that. She never forgot that. So when they did that PSA uh, announcement in, in June of 2011 about Catherine Gregg, uh, she recognized her and, 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 the, and, and their shared interest in, in Tiger the Tabby Cat. But also she had this, that's the guy that was, was ranting on, on uh, Barack Obama. It stood out so much to her that that's ultimately what led her to contact the police after she saw that PSA. One of the interesting things, and, and you mentioned this in your book, when he assumes the identity of Charlie Gasco, yeah. he's assuming the identity of a man who's not that powerful, doesn't live extraordinarily well. And when we mostly think of mob bosses, we think these are the guys that live beyond everyone else. So what was it about Whitey Bulger that let him behave more like an ordinary man? That's a great question, because in, and that's the kind of thing we explore in our, in our biography, because he, here he is, a crime boss, used to killing people and, and living high in Boston and whatnot. How could he you know, f flick that switch to become Charlie Gasco? And I think it's a lot to do with, with, with you know, what makes him tick is control. Catch me if you can. Mm. When he was a crime boss in Boston, he didn't, he, material, you know, wealth and, and showiness was not part of his makeup. He didn't buy a mansion the way some of the mafia dons did. Sure, he liked nice things, but it wasn't over the top. So I think it was, it was more with him. It was about, they can't catch me. They couldn't catch me in Boston. They can't catch me now. I can assume now the new mask of Charlie Gasco. And, and lived a good life in Santa Monica. You, you would suggest in the book that it, the significance of, of Whitey Bulger wasn't the, the body count, and there was a significant body count, oh, yeah. but, it, but it was actually what he did with the FBI. Absolutely. I think history's going to show that he's one of the leading crime figures of the 20th century for that very reason. We can't forget that in, in, from 75 until 95, he'd become an informant for the FBI, but very quickly in 75, he turned the table so that he harnessed the FBI's power. The Boston office was 
corrupted by him, and they became like a shield for him. Yeah. Uh, they, they were his, his personal security force. That's the historical marker here, I think, and it should trouble us all because we're talking about the nation's top law enforcement agency, their worst informant scandal in, in the history of the Bureau. Really fascinating stuff. Dick Lair, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate Thank you. it. Appreciate it.